Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, tuning into this podcast again. I just want to tell you on this particular podcast, there's actually a drinking game sort of built into it. If you want to play the Futures Edge drinking game, you take a drink uh, every single time we say either capitulation or Scott Shelley. Make sure it's not heavy liquor. We'll see you guys in the show. Futures Edge podcast. I'm Jim Urio, and as always, my co-host and the brains behind the operation, executive producer, Bob Iacchino. Today, we have Bill Baruch, who is the president of Blue Line Futures and Blue Line Capital, as an old friend of ours, and we have a hell of a lot to talk about. I mean, these have just been wildly exciting couple of weeks. Everything's changing. Bill, if you had to pick one thing that's the theme right now, what do you got? Volume, capitulation, and uh, you know, go back to last week, unless you have a, a futures trading platform, you may not be able to see it, but the, con- the commodity exchange volume on the Russell 2000 was a record for the week, and the S&P futures and the NASDAQ futures both had the most volume last week since March 2020. I also saw data from Bank of America came out last night for the week ending June 22nd, $17 billion in outflows for that week ending June 22nd. And that was the first week of outflows in seven weeks. So I think we got some capitulation, you know, through that quad witching, through that May CPI number. And that's, I think, why we're ripping higher here today, uh, trying to find a bottom. Wait, so hold it. So are, if I'm paraphrasing you, are you saying you think that could be an indication that the bottom's in? I'm saying a bottom is in. And I think we can rally now into the uh, June uh, CPI number coming out in July. And my, my narrative has been it's an inflation showdown at Jackson Hole at the end of August. And what really matters is these, this June, July, and August inflation numbers that come out July, August, September. So I think inflation is going to cool. And look at commodity prices. I mean, it's been a bludgeoning. I, mean, I think the uh, Bloomberg Commodity Index is down, what, 8, eight 10% this month already. So you got prices coming in. And you know, from this month over month increases, look at where you know the, the Crude was in March, copper was in March when the, when the war started. And then, you know, a lot of this has just been we're baking through the system for, for months now. Uh, I, I think inflation comes in and, and it's going to allow the Fed to pull their foot off the gas, l- allow the market to go higher. So then that would be the case for the bottom and uh, a good buying opportunity in commodities here for the next couple of weeks. So it's interesting that you say that because I, I was on um, Scott Shelley's show today. And one thing I was pointing out is that the, the uh, five-year break-evens, which is the, uh, you know, but for people who are watching, which is the nominal yield of the five-year treasury, um, the difference between the tips. And people, the market kind of uses that to gauge of what expectations are, inflation expectations are, out for the next five years. And three, two and a half, three short months ago, is about 3.8. Now it's about 2.8. And the day after, June 13th and 14th, which was the trading days after that disastrous um, June 10th CPI number, it went from 320 to a low of like 2.7. So that market is telling us something. Also, over the last two weeks, we're starting to pull tightenings out that we had previously priced in, particularly ones like from a year out. Like now there's only a 10% chance that in July of 2023, there's going to be uh, the the terminal rate 3.75 or above. It was 40% just two weeks ago. Are these all signs that we've hit peak inflation and now we're starting lower? I think so, at least for now. And, and you, you, that is the lowest level on this five-year break evens on the year. And I, I think the um, you know right now we have a pocket to work through. If, if inflation cools, we get a September pause. But guess what comes around the corner is I, I think it's an energy winter. I think it's gonna be an ugly one. I mean, it, obviously poor policy decisions for for years. You know, in in Eastern Europe, throughout Europe, and, and the dependence on Russian oil. So I, I do think that that energy and you know prices are going to remain very high. Uh, and they're going to be really reinvigorated from, from where levels they are when the winter comes. So I, I do think inflation reemerges, uh, but I think we have a, a nice path forward, at least for the next you know, few months. So I think what we're saying kind of is that um, you know, they had to adjust demand. They had to bring us to even probably recessionary, probably or possibly, I'll, I'll leave you to answer that, the recessionary territory in order to get demand back in line with supply. Are the markets telling us that the recession is here? And paradoxically, are they saying that the stock market doesn't necessarily have to hate that because if, if the Fed pivots, it goes higher? 
Yeah, you know, that's a great point. And you mentioned Scott Shelley's show. One thing, him and I, I, I join him usually on, uh, it was every Tuesday. And when we talk about this recession, we, almost every single time we're on there every week. And and, and my my theme is we're in a recession. I don't need two, two quarters of contracting GDP to call it. We're in a recession. The stock market looks ahead 9, 12, and 18 months. The stock market is pricing in this recession already. So it bottoms, you know, and, and I've, I've for clients who've been sort of really nervous about the market, the housing market, I'll give them a comparison. Just, you know, I don't think this is anything like the great financial crisis, but when the market fell off 2008, you know, actually 30 year bond yields trickled higher at the worst time of the, of the market. And then they rolled over as the housing prices got worse. The only reason the market, the stock market from that initial really big plunge ended up falling off a bit more was because the massive the bankruptcies throughout the, you know, the banking sector that happened. So I, that's not going to happen this time. So really this market's going to find a bottom well before, you know, yields start, start really coming in. And those yields start coming in. It's going to fuel it higher. So I, I, I think the, the recession is here. The market's trading like it's recession. And that, that puts it forward, a, a, you know, a better picture in the future here. Uh, and two points to bring in uh, on top of that before we bring Bobby in for a question, because you mentioned energy. I'm sure he's going to want to weigh in on that. Goldman came out with a piece last week saying, um, the last 17 times the stock market has been down more than 15%. Hit 11 of those times, it bottomed as the Fed pivoted to neutral or pivoted to dovish from, from hawkish. I think we, the, the market needs that, first off. Don't you, don't you agree? They need to, some soothing words from the Fed that there's an end in sight before the bottom's really in. Yeah, they, they need to stop moving the goalposts. And that, I'm waiting for that. I think that's when we, we see this inflation number come in. That's why and I think one of the reasons underpinning stocks here today and, and through this week, not only the capitulation narrative, but but commodity prices coming in, they're already starting to discount the the inflation in this in this price action. So I, I think that I feel confident expecting CPI to be cooler than expectations or coming in pretty well relative to that main number. And that's going to allow the Fed to, to pause. I mean, I think there's definitely some members on that Fed committee that that have were doves, want to be doves and have turned very hawkish because they have they have to not only. You know, for political reasons and just to save face, they're ready to become, you know, at least neutral right now. And they're ready to pivot. I mean, you even saw that from um, the Atlanta Fed President Bostic, who made a couple of comments. It was back in May. The market lifted pretty good. He's pretty inf influential there. And uh, I, I forget, I think it might have been Esther George, who is now retiring as well. She's the Kansas City Fed President. But she made some pretty, you know, that they're ready to pause. So I think we could start hearing the echoes. That's why it's an inflation showdown at Jackson Hole, because if we start to if we get two softer inflation numbers, then then we could see them pivot at Jackson Hole, maybe, you know, as a pause going into September. Bobby, you want to weigh in? Because I remember I said I had two points. I could only remember one of them. Um, it's Friday. It's Friday. We record well, this on first Friday of all, afternoon. <laughs> what do you got? First of all, this is the first time I've seen Billy since I left Chicago. So it's good to see you again, buddy. Good to see you again. Um, used to get to see you at least once or twice a week in the recording booth there at the CME floor. But I want to push back on one thing before I ask you a question. And I want your clarification. When you say we're in a recession now, you don't need two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Number one, does that mean that that's your definition? Because it is mine. It's two consecutive quarters of negative growth. And number two, are you saying that because you think this particular quarter of GDP is going to be negative? Or you're basically saying the term doesn't matter, people are hurting? Term doesn't matter. People are hurting, and, okay. and I I would lean on that, that two quarters to say, hey, an official recession has happened. But listen, pe people are hurting. The market is hurting. I I'm talking to clients that, that certainly feel like they're in a recession. You know, who, whose wealth portfolios are managing them. And just even though we've we've actually held ground, we're we're we we are doing very well this year relative to their benchmarks. And people just are nervous about the prices they're paying at the grocery store, their gas prices. The economy is hurting, and that's that's where um, you know I think the the recession term is. Uh, Jobs market is, isn't though. Yeah. Just that. Well, that's the thing. So I don't think that the National Bureau of Economic Research is going to claim this as a recession because unemployment rates are three point six, and I don't think they'll actually come out. Even though I'll still stick with that two consecutive quarters of negative growth as the definition, but Neighbor has said that they actually look at uh, the unemployment rate as part of it. And then I go back and I look at the savings rate, the savings rate right now, this past month of data that we got, lowest level since September of 2008. Now, interesting, the level of savings is still good, but the rate of savings has declined dramatically. Now, that implies to me, and I don't have anything to back this up, Billy, but that implies to me that this is hurting sort of in a trickle up way. In other words, people with the least savings 
are now going to debt. And then the next level is declining their savings. Then the next level is decline a little bit. And then you've got the wealthy who, yeah, they're saving a little bit less, but it doesn't really matter to them. Um, so I guess my question then becomes, if you think, I love the way you worded it, that we're at a bottom, we're not necessarily at the bottom. I called for a bottom three weeks ago, and I've still said that I don't think I'm wrong yet. Because even though we rotated and made new lows, it just said to me that we're actually declining in the possibility of more declines. Is that what you're saying? You know, I'll say right now, we are moving to 3,900 in the S&P uh, on a closing basis. That's the gap from, from previous Friday. So that, that's a really good sign. I want to see that decisive move for, for the bottom, I mean, at least a bottom right now. Uh, but back back to back to the, the recession terminology, um, you know, Goldman Sachs in, 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 in a note actually put out um, was a lot earlier this week that they increased their odds of recession pretty much basically twofold. Let's let's generally call it. Yeah, it was and, like seventy percent um, or something. Yeah, yeah. I actually have the have the numbers here right Quick now. Quick timeout though. Would like to say that we the the two of us, Bobby and I, Scott Shelley, were way ahead of Goldman Sachs saying exactly ahead. when the recession oh, yeah. was coming to. And I'm not a big searcher for attaboys. Oh, who am I kidding? I am. <laughs> but come on, the writing was on the wall. I don't know what the hell was taking those guys so long, but Billy, go. Well, that's, that's also a capitulation thing. The headlines are now making, the recession headlines are now making it. You're hearing every newspaper, every media outlet, every bank talking about a recession. That I mean, that's just another word, you know, another version of capitulation. You know, it's a volume of headlines. So, it, and then in that in that terminology, it was, it was increase the odds of recession from 30 from, to 30% from 15% this year and 48% into 48% from 35% over the next two years. So they're basically saying 50, 50 shot of recession over the next two years, but you know, back to the unemployment, they expect un unemployment on average, this recession is going to be front loaded. And that's what I agree with. That, that's why I, I'm saying the market is realizing a recession right now. It's a front loaded recession because it's, it's from the fed tightening it's instrumented by the fed. And then in something like this, Unemployment will rise on average about two and a half percent. So I think it's very fair to say we'll see six percent inflation and it'll be called a recession. This question, I got a question for both of you. I'll start with Billy, but Bobby, I want you to weigh in it too. Because what I said again, and I hate to bring up the name Scott Shelley four times in one show. This is the last time I'll bring up his name. For, believe me. <laughs> um, what, when I was talking to him today, my belief is that we are going in recession if we're not in a recession, as, as you said. I believe that recession is not going to be particularly deep because when we saw in the Great Recession, that was just decades of decades of leverage built up in housing that needed to be work, worked off in an illiquid asset over the next few years. And it was terrible for a long, long time. I believe this recession will be relatively shadow, shallow because I don't see those positions built up. But I think it could be long unless the government flips on stupid energy policy regarding fossil fuel. Bill, can you weigh in on that? And then Bob, you. Yeah, I mean, right now, I mean, they're they're trying to throw the kitchen sink on it. And I think what they've done is actually extremely bullish. I mean, they've drawn down SPR to the lowest levels with 1987. I mean, they're they're doing this. Oh, well, you're saying bullish on crude oil or bullish on the economy? Bullish on, on crude oil. And that's Got why it. I'm saying it, the, it, we're going to see a negative impact on the economy through the, maybe the first quarter of next year. It's going to be Europe that may hit, some, hit first. Our exports, you know, to Europe, we stop exporting at some point, they're going to get hurt more. Uh, and then you really could see effects. That, so that, that's why way I'm looking at this right now. And um, you know, my, my focus is, is, is how am I trading this for the next three to four months? It's hard to look much past that. And I was just actually just on CNBC before I came on here. And, and one of the things they were talking about this sort of commodity move down. And, and I, I was just, I'm, I'm focusing on the commodity move down as a buying opportunity over the next few months. Um, but energy, you know, really, I, I think is going to, is going to be almost unstoppable in this, in this wave of policy. Other commodities, as inflation picks back up due to energy, could actually get hurt because it's going to deepen into a recession where energy caused by energy. So as we go into quarter four, I mean, I mean, look at these. So the SPR 1987, I think it's the lowest level. You have this gas tax that that they're that they're saying is going to you know make it a little cheaper. It's all political, but at this point too, it's encouraging more demand you know, through this driving season, which then is going to you know prop up prices further. So I, I think that the, where they're heading here in energy policy is just going to be very ugly. Yes, Bobby. Bobby, even when they try to do something good. They're trying to handle what's the supply problem that is potentially a self-inflicted wound by increasing demand with the, the gas tax. Next thing they're going to do is to send people checks and gas cards to increase demand even further, right, Bobby? Well, sure. I mean, that's what the gas tax holiday is likely to do. It's it's not going to decline people's usage of their vehicles. And, and you know, 
uh, encourage carpooling or public transportation where it's available, it's going to allow people to go, okay, I'm 30 to 70 cents cheaper a gallon, depending on which states join in on the tax holiday and which states you live in. Then I say, okay, I got my little break. I'm going to go ahead and drive. So that right there in and of itself increases demand. And I think the convoluted energy policy is where I, I completely agree with your premise, Jim, and, and Bill's conclusion. Bill's got clients, right? He's got to get them a return. And I totally agree with the buying the dip on commodities for either reason. And what I mean by that is crude oil, like I'm not, I don't have a position in crude oil right now, but as I look at it, I'm looking for places to buy it. Uh, I'm not necessarily looking for places to short it. And granted, my buy levels are quite a bit lower than we are right now, somewhere in the range of $12 or so lower than we are right now, but it's still a buy. If we get an easing of the crude oil structural issues, then the push comes for electric vehicles again, and then you got bids and things like copper and, and short-term bids in most of the commodities. And then you have, again, this shrinking supply, which brings crude oil right back up. Like over the next two or three years, I, I can't see too many scenarios, maybe one or two, where commodities actually give up the, what is it, give up the goat, give up the game? It's a give up Give something. up the ghost is what I thought it's it was. The ghost. I don't know what give that up, means. I'm going to go with goat since I'm an immigrant give up kid. The I'm going to give up the goat. <laughs> and yeah, and I think the inflation bug is here. You know, Billy, we talked a while back. And I keep asking the question of most guests, and I'll ask you the same question. What does inflation success look like for the Fed? Is it 4.5%? Is it 3%? Because the idea that they're going to get it down to 2.5% and still have unemployment at 4 or below is, I think they know that's insane. I, I did a, a little history lesson for clients in my morning note yesterday on Paul Volcker. And one of the things that I thought that was extremely important this week that nobody talked about was that Fed Chair Powell said he would never compare himself to Paul Volcker in any way. I think that was that should have been talked about much more because he he's I mean he may, it's going to be unavoidable. People much less smart than him, but much higher up have already made his bed for him with that energy policy. Uh, but but overall, you know what he's saying is is he's going to take his foot off the gas. So again, he doesn't want to be known for the worst recession in U.S. history and an unemployment rate. Of, 10 percent so they're going to they're going to massage this in, in you know in, in, in every way that that they can and for them back in in 1982 83 inflation was at 12 percent it came back to eight percent and that was almost a little bit of a victory there so if we're at eight percent you know we see four or five percent i mean it's going to be a i mean four four point nine pce is, is a very watered down number it was 4.9 percent for for i think what what april uh we're gonna get ready to get the main number here next week um but but yeah we see See something at back five percent, five and a half percent or lower on, on uh, you know that that could start to be you know moving towards a winning streak. A couple a couple things I wanted to say first is that the CPI you know we act like it's running around eight point five. The um, rents and rents equivalent portion of that, which is thirty three percent of it, has it was an increase of like five percent uh, year over year, which is asinine. Everybody with a pair of eyes knows that it's much much higher than that, and that's being calculated ineffectually. Um, we're get to inflation hedges though. Um, it, Ethereum, Bitcoin, gold, silver, real estate. What are the inflation hedges if we're going to live through as what we, it appears that you guys are both saying, we believe another round of inflation is coming up. What, how do we hedge that? Depends what the driver is. I mean, it, you know, I mean, it, people are chasing energy stocks now for, you know, on the wealth side, I have people panicking out of portfolios or want to, you know, you know, again, we, we're, We've done we've done very well relative to our benchmarks. I mean, we're beating it by double digits this year. But I'm, I'm getting new clients have, that have had uh, you know have had very tough times, and they're coming from portfolio drawdowns 30, 40 percent, and they they don't want equity exposure. And I tell them at these levels, you you need equity exposure. I wouldn't let my grandma get out of a, a 40 percent drawdown at these levels. And um, and you know, so at this at these levels, you know, if you got to say where are where are the markets and what are we looking at? I think the tradable opportunity here is, is being long tech. I'm looking at, you know, because the inflation narrative is going to cool. When it picks back up, what's going to be the driver of inflation? Is it going to be energy? I mean, you, you need to be overweight energy. And one of the reasons why we've done very well this year is, is I mean, I, I have 15 to 25% weighting of energy throughout the year. Uh, relative to the S&P, that was what, started the year at two, 
two and now maybe it's almost five percent now so it, it really depends what's going to be the driver and you know gold people say they gold gold stinks and gold never did what it's supposed to do gold did exactly what it was supposed to do gold front run their inflation and that's 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 the thing if you have had gold in your portfolio for the last decade you're gonna be you're very happy with it so there's gonna be another time where gold is going to perform and that could be at the end of the summer when the fed does start to pause stop moving the goalposts so i like having gold and, and we use we use a uh a number of different assets that to give us mining and, and metals exposure. So to, before I let Bobby in for another question too, you mentioned the NASDAQ later on in the show, I'm going to give my trade and it's a NASDAQ trade. What are you, what you are, you're saying, if I can paraphrase, I want to see if you agree is that the, the NASDAQ was suffering obviously disproportionately because tech stocks, growth stocks hate rates going higher and the belief that rates are going higher still. So they were getting pummeled by that. If we're the, getting this brief respite, and that perhaps rates aren't going higher as quickly as we thought, then then the NASDAQ could respond very favorably to that, correct? Yeah. yeah okay, been, good. Yeah, one stuff. word answer. Well, no one in our business ever gives <laughs> one word answer. That's fabulous. Bobby, what do you got? Billy, can we have a recession without an increase in crude oil prices? And I know that historically we can, but if you look at the last three, 2001 recession, 2008 recession, 2001 crude oil increased almost threefold, just short of threefold prior to the recession starting. 2008, obviously we all know what happened. 2007, 2008, was, that was a 143, 139 to 143 a barrel crude oil. And now we have this potential one. But Bobby, before he answers, why does that happen? Why does crude go up if we're going into a recession? Well, I just think recessions are preceded by growth. And I know that kind of sounds stupid, but it's recessions come when the Fed adjusts policy after a huge growth yeah. run, right? And we know that at least the recent recessions were essentially caused by the Fed. I don't think that's a controversial statement, is it, Billy? No, I mean, it's, I mean, you, you have the growth, you know, what, what's maybe more recent times, you have what's pumping the growth. And, and, um, and I mean, people are demanding, you know, demanding energy and then, there's other things that have, have taken place around that time. I mean, crude, crude, inter, the world runs on energy. It was a great commercial by energy transfer out in the national championship football game. And I, I've, I've hit on as something, you know, all year long and everything is made from it, from energy, petroleum products. And I mean, it's from, from plastics to, you know, I, look at your desk. I can probably pick 10 things on my desk right now that were made for petroleum. So, I mean, it, it runs the world and that's, it was those prices go higher you know, it's it's going to drive up the cost of living, and that's where recessions come. Um, real quick, going back to Jim, what you said with with the uh, Nasdaq, uh, um, you know, I gave you one word answer. Yeah, it's a place to be. But a couple of things I'm watching on the Nasdaq is uh, very closely is the relative strength the, of the Qs to the staples. And there was a little bit of an inverse head and shoulders on this chart here this week, and that's something I'm really looking at. Where you get a move higher. And in NASDAQ and the, the staples are not going to really pace with that. Even you're going to see even some selling in staples to, to put more, more cash into the tech stocks. So you get this like thrust, this power thrust in, in the NASDAQ relative to staples. To me, it's been it's been a precursor to a continued move. So we're, we're getting that pretty nicely today as, as the SP is breaking out about 3,900. There's also, like I mentioned, the capitulation, the volume. But even, you know, one of the reasons why I think that that relationship was so important, well, actually, two reasons. First, the Nasdaq, obviously, the biggest stocks in the world are are, are with the Nasdaq, and and you're going to be selling some of your your safer assets to buy more risky assets, and that that would show through that strength. And then both the S and P and the Nasdaq, when they broke through the new lows last week, they kind of both were in no man's land, and, and there's there's no retracements, there's no volume pockets, there really wasn't much. What's going to tell us that there's going to be a low? So you can start looking at some of these different relative strength indices or uh, you know comparisons. And the Dow though wasn't in no man's land. The Dow did come back down to the pre-COVID high, and it was also I think it was a three eight two retracement as well. So I mean there there was good good things to look at and anchor against here uh, today, it, given that we had the volume capitulation last week and through this week. So uh, to, can you wind that a little tighter for me? So you're saying yes, NASDAQ, no Dow and Staples? No, I, I still like the Dow of support, but because the Dow could be, I mean, one of the best stocks performing this week is Salesforce, up, up 12, 13% maybe. Um, so, I mean, I think the Dow can perform very well, but I mean, it's going to be outpaced by by the NASDAQ in this move. I mean, today, I mean, you got 2%, what is it, almost 2, 2.5% on the, on the Dow, and you're about 3% on the, on the NASDAQ. So yeah, and okay, so I get it now. You were saying yes, Nasdaq, but Staples, not so sure of that relationship. Was that? Yeah. Got yeah, it. Now, also, sure. Can we talk about uh, uh, cryptocurrencies? Are you still getting calls from clients who want to be involved in crypto, or is that 
Breeze change direction? It hasn't, you know, I, I wasn't getting calls so much from clients to, to do it. It, uh, it was conversations I had with current clients asking me, you know, about what I'm doing. I've been invested on and off in crypto since 2017, and, and it's, been, it's been a great ride. Um, I, I didn't get out of it enough, you know, when it falls as much as it did recently. But I woke up Sunday morning, gave myself a Father's Day present, and, and, and threw a slug at uh, Solana and Ethereum. And I mean, so I continue to trade this thing. And I, I think there's good value down here where we are. Just that was my my way of getting some risk on, uh, you know, given given that the markets were going to be closed or, you know, futures weren't open yet Sunday night uh, because this was Sunday morning. And so, yeah, I think I think they're going to follow. It's a risk asset. We've seen it. You know, It's a risk asset. Um, you know, it's also a lot of things are going to rely on the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar has been extremely elevated and uh, consolidating if the dollar rolls over i mean i think i think crypto is going to do very well and stocks are going to do very well um you know as well we're going to have to see rates come in a bit more and there's definitely some support at three percent psychologically as well at the 10 year as well as a uh you know there's a trend line there too bobby i just realized i i'm, I'm remiss because with billy who i respect a ton but i i know that you know normally on this podcast we have a couple icebreaker established credibility questions that I totally skipped over at the beginning. And I think I do that because subconsciously, I think Bill is a, a serious person who's very serious and goes after things. Bill already had his credibility. You didn't have to ask. He him. has his credibility. That's exactly what I'm saying too. But I think we should go back to that too, though, don't you think? Because we have to know like what his favorite show is over the last couple of years. The, the best show that you watch, because if it's something stupid, we just have to look at everything else you say with a grain of salt. What's the best show you've watched on television over the past two years, Billy? And dogs or cats, what do you prefer? Oh, man. You know, I guess more re recency bias. Uh, one of the better ones was Ozarks. Um, but yeah. there was nobody to like in Ozarks. Who did you like? Oh, man, you know, I guess you. Say, it's a good question. In the last in the last season, you know, there there wasn't really you kind of hated everybody. Um, I hate everybody. <laughs> yeah, but it, but it was it was it was sort of like the the um what's the what's the the show Bloodline? You know, the last season of Bloodline, you sort of just hated everybody too. That was which was a great show for the first two seasons. But yeah, yeah, I liked it because I go to the Keys a lot, so I love the Isla Mirada shots in Bloodline. I thought it was very cool. Oh, Bobby too. We had um Mitch Rochelle on this show, and he talked about Winning Time, the Lakers show, which I, I then it. went back and watched. Did you watch it, Fantastic. Bobby? Fantastic. It, it's unbelievable. It blows me away. And I had a buddy who was on the team. Uh, back then and I keep texting him about is any of this true and he's res refused to respond to any of the questions about it and definitely changed the subject each time Jerry but West was supposed to be good pissed about it but I really I can't not like Ruth even though she turned into kind of a well you know what I'm going to leave it because may maybe people haven't watched it but yeah. I, st I still can't not like Ruth just her one-liners are the best probably in the history of television she's a good char great character and um yeah, there was definitely some great scenes with her. One of you the didn't answer uh, dogs or cats, though, Billy. So go ahead, dogs, finish for sure. Dogs for sure. Uh, okay, good. Uh, finish your one, sentence in the roof. One thing I saw recently was uh, the Adam Sandler hustle movie, which which I thought I was so, thought was surprisingly good. I saw that actually this week. I I uh, was it after maybe Tuesday's close or whatever. I was like, I need to forget about Mark. Sorry about that. <laughs> so I needed to forget about markets, and I as like, I just put on a trade. <laughs> watch a movie hey, s&p is going out on the highs the nasdaq just ripped 40 through the highs i mean it's it's a beautiful day it's a beautiful day um but he, i thought that was a great movie and it was really cool seeing so many nba stars all in all in one movie uh really really surprised me you know how how good it was he, he did cool. a really good evidence and you have a dog right i i don't have a dog i got i got three three kids three daughters three daughters the oldest one turn, turns five in uh under two oh months my God. You're so yeah, we, our youngest is one. So it's five, three, and one. Yeah, right. we we got enough of our, of our hands full at the moment, but there probably will be a dog in our future soon. I, I'll have to get a, a male dog for sure to you know get get some <laughs> testosterone in the house. <laughs> I'm a man with daughters as well, and I have a female dog, and so I'm uh, definitely a minority. Uh, Bobby, uh, the next topic I was going to steer toward currency. We talked about the dollars for a second. Do you think there's anything else that's more interesting than that? Where, where would you go? No, I, I like the dollar and I'd like to come back to crypto simply because my trade is going to be a crypto trade. But um, the dollar for me uh, seems to be not just about interest rates at this weird point in time because of the trade issues going on. Uh, so many more trade deals from what I'm hearing are being done in dollars and emerging markets of uh, bond issuance, dollar denominated bond issuance have fallen off a cliff. And I find that interesting. Billy, do you, do you like look into anything from 
uh, strength of the dollar and anything other than interest rate differentials, or is it just all interest rates for you? You know, I, I look at it, you know, because it's always trading against something else. It's not just the dollar itself. So people forget that. And, and it's, you know, where I, I see other central banks trying to tighten right now. So I think that's something that, that I think will, um, you know, will underpin some of those other currencies. I, I do think that that the dollar typically usually peaks at the onset of a hiking cycle. It's just we've had inflation where the goalposts keep getting moved. That's one of the reasons why I'm bullish gold when this goalpost stop being moved. But from a currency dynamic, um, I, I think you know what's going on with with Russia uh, and China right now, and um, I think it's it, it's not being watched close enough. Um, you know, so Russia's selling their their oil, and they're going to sell it. You know, at a Every discount. Barrel of it. Yeah, they're they're going to get a discount. Asia. Uh, China, which is you know China and India, they're buying in hand over fist at a discount. They're they're gonna they'll pay you know whatever currency they want from it. Um, and and overall, I, I think it's it's I watched the U.S. dollar Chinese yuan relationship, and now obviously the U.S. dollar strengthening quite a bit against the yuan. When um, it's very important to watch for the metals, if you trade the metals, you have to watch this relationship. And um, you know it, the it strengthened quite a bit when when they were going through lockdowns and then pulled back. Where the, the yuan strengthened against the dollar as uh, they came out of lockdowns and it's sort of consolidating right now. And I think one of the questions is is you know are they going to are they really going to weaken the yuan a bit more because because they can uh, and then they're going to sort of be able to kind of almost stimulate because they are they are easing policy and how does that affect you know what they're the commodities that they're going to be able to buy and so I, I I'm watching that relationship very very closely on but is it my my question that I don't know the answer yet is is it still relative to the US dollar like it was say a year ago, or, or maybe it is still right now, or does it become less, the relationship with the yuan against the dollar become less relative, given that they're can that they getting commodities and other currencies. So it, it, I don't have the answer for that right now, but I, that's something I think is, is gonna be of the utmost importance of the next So, so something more, more meaty about the currency debate. When you look at the ruble's appreciation over the last um, uh, you know couple months, and you look at the fact that what you just mentioned, that China and India are buying crude at a discount and our alleged um, partners in this whole global thing, Europe, is buying discount at a, I mean, buying crude at a huge, huge premium. Is this, is the, the it, where are the embargoes, the embargoes that we as a country pushed and advocated for, it seems like it's nonsense and it's absolutely having the exact opposite effect what it was supposed to. Any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's having the worst, having an opposite effect on it because it's it's putting all the power in in Russia's hands, and they're they're going to sell it at a discount because they're getting it in rubles, and the rubles appreciate at thirty percent. It's no brainer. Yeah, Bobby, you thought got thoughts on that? Is it idiotic? No, it's not at all. I mean, they're selling every single barrel of crude oil that they're taking out of the ground. And I actually uh, took issue with a Bloomberg reporter this morning who said that you know they're going overseas now to have a discussion on how to cap Russian profits on crude oil. Yeah, so how do you cap profits when you're not involved in the transaction? How are you possibly, what, what policy could you possibly pass? The only thing they could do is put pressure on India. They can't put pressure on China. And the they pressure on India due to the discount is not going to work. So again, we go back to Billy's original point about convoluted energy, energy policy. You too, Jim, who have if policy not consistent. You literally have no effect on what direction the price of crude oil can be driven in which is why long-term I'm going to be looking at longs. I'm the same as Billy. I've owned gold since July of last year. And I'm actually very satisfied with the very little money I've made on it because gold should, should have collapsed multiple times and did not. And that tells you a lot. There were multiple scenarios over this last 13 months or, or 11 months rather that I've held this gold position that it should have collapsed and it, and it hasn't, it's really held in. And I think part of that reason is the war and some of the effects of it in the commodity space. Yeah, so, if, we're actually, if we're going through disinflation right now mm -hmm. and, and you know, look back, I mean, this is obviously not a you know, March, 2020 disinflation event, but look at gold, happened to gold you know, at the onset of the event and went to 1700 and then it collapsed like 150 bucks to maybe, I think it was to maybe 250 bucks. 1450 did it go to? I mm -hmm. mean, but that, that's, that, that embodies, you know, what gold will do during a disinflationary event. And, and I mean, this is disinflation right now. Gold's holding above 1800. I mean, it's been trying to build a nice little floor above 1800. I'd say this is extremely constructive. If, if it's able to hold through this dis disinflation here for the next 30, 30 days when the Fed then is able to kind of pull their foot off the gas, gold's going to rip higher. And you think silver the same? 
Yeah, absolutely. Silver, silver. I would have loved to see it hold out above. What was it? 20, 21 and a quarter, 21 and a half, which was a bigger level and aligned with the uh, Brexit breakout that failed. And I think it was like a 50 percent retracement from the from the COVID low to the to the initial February 21 high. But uh, it's I mean, still holding about 20, 20 bucks. We're back above 21 today. It's been pretty constructive. So I, I, I like what gold and silver are doing. I mean, these these are areas you want to buy it and just know your risk to the downside. So Bob, to Bobby's point about energy a second ago, there was an interview with Mike Worth, the CEO of Chevron, a couple of weeks ago. And he said, and Bobby makes this point all the time, and we've said it a couple of times in the podcast, but a lot of people haven't watched every one of the podcasts because they're stupid. They should watch every one of them. But we'll say it again. Mike Worth said there'll never be another refinery built in this country ever. He was sure. He said, in order to build a refinery, you need to have a 10-year look forward and when you're going to start making money. And energy policy in this country bounces around like a freaking pinball. Um, so there'll never be another one built. Bobby has even greater statistics on that. It's just, it's absolutely confounding when you think of how important crude is and how poorly it's treated by certain facets in the administration. You agree, Bobby? I do. You can get away from carbon fuels. You can. I have no problem with that. I said this on Shelley's show the other day. Obviously, all three of us go on. Five times Shelley's we've mentioned Shelley now. Yeah, that's <laughs> insane. That's I, have a promo, insane. I have a promo for a show here. <laughs> I know, it really is. And I said it on his show. I mean, to me, it's like, who doesn't want clean water and clean air? I mean, everybody wants it. Like, who doesn't? Billy, you're an outdoorsy kind of guy going up, you know, to... Uh, I'm not going to mention where you have people will chase you. You're so handsome. Beautiful but, up there. I mean, you you <laughs> like nature. We all like clean air. We all like clean water. But you can't get away from fossil fuels overnight, pain free, and that's sort of what they've implied they want to do. And when you aren't uh, doing consistent lease sales, when you have uh, when I entered the business, there were 279 refineries, about 109 now. Um, Pipelines get shut down. Yes, the Keystone Pipeline is going to move Canadian oil, but it's the entire shipping structure of crude oil that got affected by that pipeline not being available for Canadian oil sands. So, I mean, when you're doing these kinds of things and then this happens and you try, you know, somebody said to me, every, every administration, this is not a political statement. This is not a political subject to me. Every administration has bonehead policies and they end up paying the price for it. This is not political. The energy policy has been bad in the U.S. for the last probably four administrations, simply because it's not been consistent. It's been back and forth and back and forth. And when you then go to them and you say, you know, you got to help us with this Putin price hike. It's just it's nonsensical. Uh, to, to put a finer point on that is that people accuse me of being political all the time. And it is so infuriating. <laughs> this is dumb energy policy. I real want... My, my daughter's an a, 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 a environmental engineer. We talk about this all the time. One of the reasons she got into it is because I'm a big fan of conservation. We have a home in Colorado. We believe in going on hikes. You take nothing, leave nothing. We're very, very conscious of the environment. Um, I want to switch to green energies. When, But what's happening now is going to actually push that further away. Because if we disrupt this, we just keep this pendulum in motion. Uh, Billy, you got anything on that? I agree. You agree totally. I, mean, yeah. I, mean, I don't think anything to add to that. It's, it's right. I mean, you're, you're a realist. Let's say that. Well, yeah. And when we dis you disrupt the apple cart, look what happens in Venezuela. You know, it's badly, it's bad environments when, when the government takes over and then there's no consistent policy and no capitalistic means of, of pursuing things. And then things fall to hell. And this is just absolutely ridiculous. Bobby, you wanted to hit um, uh, cryptos before we go to the trade part of it. So Bobby, you want to key that? I want to know what, what the hell are cryptos? What are they a hedge of? What are they? Are they just a risk asset? I, I don't know if I want to necessarily. Add. I mean, I, I think I'm stealing this from OJ Rennick from TD Ameritrade. He called them a high beta store of value. And, and I really like that. I think people looking at their recent performance would say, how would you possibly call it a store of value? Well, it is high beta. We did say that. And <laughs> it's certainly not a currency. I mean, it, it, at this stage, I think it has to become one in order to survive. But I actually I pulled this up because I want to show this to you guys, because I'm going to do in the trade segment of our podcast, I'm going to do an Ethereum trade. But I, I pulled this up because I exited all my cryptos in March. And I'm very fond of saying that in, I don't know if you guys can see this. I'll actually send the editor. Um, that's a clip of me saying Bob Icino is completely out of crypto. It's the TD Ameritrade interview where I said I'm out of it. It's March 
30th or something like that. Um, I'm very fond of saying that in my 29 year career, I've bought the low and sold the high four times. Uh, I think I could make it five with that March crypto sale. Nice. But actually, cryptos rallied after I sold them, to be honest. They rallied up another eight, nine percent, and then they fell from there. Um, but I do think that to Bill's point about capitulation, I think we've seen short term crypto capitulation on the 15th of June volume in the crypto futures, the, the Ethereum futures specifically, were the highest ever at the CME group, highest volume they'd ever had. And um, we got pretty close to what many people who are deep in this world tell me is the break even price for Bitcoin miners, which is 18,000. So because of that, I like the bottom here. I mean, I like, the, I like this as a short to medium term bottom for crypto because the second wave of capitulation would be just the, even the just dead strong, I'm not gonna say that word they use, the dead strong long-term holders would have to get out if people started mi stopped mining it because it costs too much to mine it. So I think cryptocurrency survive. I think Bitcoin survives. But I think Bitcoin is much, much more worth looking at down around 11,000 than it is here long term. But I am going to go long now. Billy, we, we said the word capitulation. You said it like three times. Bobby just said it once. And in crypto, I 100 percent believe it's true. And I, one of the things I base that on is that people are scared to say anything positive about crypto over the last couple of weeks for fear of ridicule. Like it is totally not cool to bring up Bitcoin or Ethereum right now. But in stocks, you said you thought you saw capitulation too. And do the do the statistics really back that up? Are people really getting out of their stocks, Billy? Unfortunately, I mean, I, I've talked to you know, not not to get into too many particulars, but you know, clients that that uh, are new clients that have come to me, and you know, and and it's they've taken you know they had a great twenty twenty one. I mean, you, you could you know you could the whole board was a bullseye. Uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, they're down 40% in the first half of this year and, you know, they're looking for another answer. Um, but I've told too many people, like you, you can't sell your port whole portfolio now that you're down 40%. I wouldn't even let my grandma do that. And yeah. that, that's, but it, those type of conversations are very common. Um, and I think that's, that's part of the, part of the capitulation. People just has to rewatch the George Costanza investing method from that Seinfeld episode, which by the way, it's very valuable i'm only half joking when he says that when every fiber in his body and his mind tells him to sell he buys yes, <laughs> that's the opposite episode <laughs> and i think it's fantastic right Bobby, let's we do some we do some business with a company that does multiple things we do some analysis for them some white label analysis at path and i'm privy to their customer service emails and uh, without getting too specific, because I don't want anyone having any clue what company this is, some clients, it's desperation in the, do you think crypto will rebound comments? I mean, one specific, the guy said, I was up 2 million, now I'm down 2.8 million. And uh, I'm assuming the eight was probably the initial investment. Um, if there's some really, really ugly things going on. And I think five years from now, we'll all feel pretty lucky that those of us who invested money, we could afford to lose whether we took profit or not, as opposed to people who are dumping everything into it. Yeah. And that's, and that to me, that is heart wrenching to hear that story. And I know really there's is. a lot of people that way, but can, we've been in the business a long, long time. Bobby and I, Billy, not, not as, I mean, at least I hope you're, you, you look young. I think you're young, but the, the point 30, is, is that we see, I've been, I've been trading, I've been trading for two decades. See if I can say now. Okay. Nice. Very nice. But yeah. um, we meet people who don't understand risk and don't, and, and it's just really, really sad when, and that old thing, a fool and his money are soon to part. And these people aren't fools in everything. In many ways, they're very, very intelligent people, but they just don't understand the risks that they're taking. And what's what's mm -hmm. the worst that could happen? Um, by the way, when my wife always says, oh, what's the worst that can happen? Usually what she's talking about could easily result in death, dismemberment or terrible things. <laughs> so I'm always like, you don't use that, right? Because <laughs> I can think of the worst things that can happen here. So but anyway, let's move on to the trading portion of this because it is Friday. And I, Bobby, I know you have a drink in your hand, but I want to have one soon. Uh, Bill, you're going to stay with us to talk about trading. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, you know, and I'll, I'll add just real quick. I, I've worked in the brokerage industry for years. So obviously I've been wealth management, but the brokerage industry, I've seen, I've seen it all. And I've seen retail investors do, you know, I mean, we're, they're not people doing their own decisions and, and you see the worst decisions. You learn a lot 
from seeing even just small money and big money make those bad decisions. And it it is definitely a lesson, you know, kind of seeing those same mistakes by different people. Big, big money, particularly pension funds, because that's usually somebody's brother-in-law who has absolutely no qualifications who was given $5 billion to run a pension fund. Yeah, yeah that's just, it's funny. That's why I kind of want to, Billy's background is kind of why I want to encourage people to check out Blue Line Capital, because if you're looking for somebody who is going to try with all his might to not let you mess things up, uh, it, it's Bill Baruch, just for the record. But no so considering that I just basically shit on crypto, um, I'm going to do a crypto long here. I'm going to do a micro ether trade. All right. I'm actually in this one. Okay. So I bought micro ether today at 1207. Now, Micro Ether is a great place for people to speculate in crypto because it is tiny. These are tiny contracts, right? So I'm in at 1207 and it's really only because there's a double bottom and there's nothing in my way target wise that's going to stop me from reaching the target and get people maybe in with the second bout of capitulation, at least fingers crossed. The chart looks really good for me on a daily. It's a tiny, tiny little double bottom. So it's definitely a speculative trade. My target's 1375, and that's a measured move target on this with an entry at 1207. The trigger was around 1193 or so. Don't quote me on that, that particular price. But bought at 1207, target 1375, stop price is 1078. You're risking $12.90 per contract to make $16.80 per contract. So I've obviously got multiple contracts on, but if you wanted to just see, you know, how does this trade? How does it feel? You could do a literary risk less than 15 bucks. Yeah. So that's right. Again, and I don't mean this to sound like a commercial, but I really think when the CME launched the suite of micro uh, contracts, it's such a wonderful thing for people who want to experiment with futures. Futures have risks. We have disclaimers all over the place. Futures have substantial risk. We talk about mitigating risk. Um, back to your ether trade real quick. Uh, Bitcoin has a level that I think at like 22,000 that I thought if it, if it can close a bar above that, I think it's heading much, much higher. Do you look much at the correlation between the two? Are you looking at both charts or are you just looking at Ether? I don't actually lately. So not so much lately, but say about a month or so ago, Bitcoin was actually, actually at a slightly higher correlation to the NASDAQ than it did to Ether which I thought was interesting. Ether is interesting uh, from a structural standpoint because they're trying to switch from proof of work to stake. And that basically means you don't have to have the complicated mining mathematical uh, calculations done by a computer that uses up all that energy in order to establish the transaction on the blockchain. They haven't made that switch yet. So you might actually, uh, they're having problems with actually getting the mechanics right. So you might actually see uh, a decisive decorrelating of those two down the road, but the pattern isn't in place in Bitcoin. While so, I think they'll probably both follow the path, the pattern is only in Ether, so I can only measure the target in Ether. Billy, when I ask you to comment on this trade, I'm going to I'm going to put a specific light on it and see if you agree. Do the the nastiness that have happened in some of the off-brand coins over the last couple of months, stable coins, the Celsius project or whatever the hell that thing is called and those getting just pummeled and then the rumors of bitcoin and ethereum having to be sold because they were held as collateral for those things when the dust all settles do the two biggest coins become much more important because they're broadly held and in contrast to those little crap coins that they look great um with that you know that's that's a very good question and i'd like to think that it's going to be typically you see bitcoin and ether make a move and then the other ones sort of follow just right out on the on their tail but the other is increase at a higher percentage so what i for myself i i agree with this trade so for myself sunday morning i i bought ether and i and i bought solana i bought Solana about 30 bucks i actually forget what i bought ether at but um the smaller number easy to remember is the solana yeah. <laughs> but you know and then sunday night for I, I manage i manage clients um at the brokerage i manage the cta portfolio i i bought uh, micro bitcoins you know four port four portfolios twenty thousand eight hundred on the july contract micros i love the micros there i mean like i i actually i mean i only use micros and you know it, just to be able to size my positions perfectly. It's, it's terrific. Um, from what, even the micro copper recently. So I, I totally agree with this previous high, you know, what the 20,000 level that back in, in, um, was it? Yeah. Winter 2017, 
So yeah, we're testing right into that. And then, you know, you talk about the blow ups, what's another term for blow up, you know, capitulation, basically, I mean, all that volume from that blow ups, I mean, you're getting capitulation there. And so, you know, capitulation of headlines and everything. So I I totally agree with this, but, but I really want to see some construction and want to see some follow through. I, you know, some people texted me today, some clients are like, oh, wow, crypto's not doing anything. The stock market's up so big. I, I, I think this weekend, if, if crypto is not decently higher over the weekend, I'd be worried. So let's move. First of all, we said capitulation, not 10 times, Scott Shelley, five times. I'll buy a beer to anyone who can work capitulation and Scott Shelley into the same sentence in the remaining five minutes we have on this. Bobby, can we move to my NASDAQ trade? Yeah, before you go to it, though, I think I'm going to... Uh slot in a little video of myself telling people at the start of this podcast that you can play a drinking game with this podcast every time we say scotchality or capitulation take a drink and it better not be something hard because you will be hammered oh it yeah should just be beer again risk mitigation is what we're talking about here okay so the nasdaq i do not have this trade on the reason i don't have this trade on is because i went into this week long some options I was. I talked to Mike Co. If you guys know Mike, about trades that gain uh, that gain delta as they go higher. And I put on some calls at the beginning of this week where I sold a call spread above the market and bought a way way bigger call spread above the market to see how it play out because I thought we were going to have a rally. So I've been gaining delta in the S and P all week, and today gained massive delta in the S and P. So I can't really afford to put on another long. So this is a trade that if I was flat and wasn't so exposed or ready to the long side that I would be putting on. I've been long the NASDAQ a couple of times today, but I flattened out because of those other trades I have on. So the micro September NASDAQ, I, I'm looking at buying it at 12,100, which it may have, as we started talking, gone above that because I yeah. thought that was a little bit of a breakout with a target of 12,950 on the upside and then a stop place below at 11,700. This is the set micro NASDAQ. If you hit your target, it's 850 tick. This is a you know this is a longer term trade than just a bang bang day trade. This is a couple of days thing. If you hit that, and make 850 ticks at 1700 bucks, and if you uh, get stopped out at your level, you lose 800 bucks. Again, this is the micro Nasdaq, but there's a lot of volatility in Nasdaq, so there's still some risk. This isn't the Ether contract we're talking about. First, Billy, what do you think of that trade? I, I like it. I'm long micro Nasdaqs right now. By the way, I mean it's been 800 point move in, in two days. So I mean. I, I agree with it. I, I trimmed a little, I trimmed a quarter of my position today as in the S and P's and micro Nasdaqs um, for all the portfolios that we must, everything I'm managing into 3,900, just, just because I wanted to, okay, if this thing was rejected, I would just be depressed over the weekend. I didn't take anything off. And then, you know, my target on the, on the Nasdaq was, it should clear if the S and P got the 3,900, it should clear uh, it's, it's gap that was 11,850 or so. The 21 day moving average, 12.060. There's a retrace for 12.021. We got through that. I mean, so, I mean, this, this is, can tell us me path least resistance, you know, should be higher till quarter end. And I, I like the trade. And again, and again, I, the, we talked about it earlier in the show and I didn't want to belabor the point. Part of it was rate exposure. I think rates aren't going up as fast as they were. The NASDAQ should outperform. Bobby, thoughts? Yeah, I like this trade. I like, uh, I think we're in a medium term, sort of a bear market rally here. Um, I did this trade basically in individual stocks. I didn't do it in futures for very similar reasons to you. I've still, well, I still had the silver position on that I mentioned last week and I wanted to put on this Ethereum trade, et cetera. So rather than, um, I did it in actual stocks and this is more of a futures podcast. So I don't feel a need to go into the stocks themselves, but right. um, yeah, I like this trade a lot. I think you're going to get paid on this one. Okay, my last trade, we have enough time for one more, right? Yeah, we do. Tenure. Now this is, okay, essentially I've, I've talked about the same trade for the last three weeks i'm going to do it again sometimes you just look at a chart you just look at a psychological level and when you know exactly where your stop should be then it looks then it looks to you like a decent trade to the upside the 10-year has had very difficult time coming back down through uh the three percent level the two-year did it just fine it bounced back up from it but the two-year came down below um three percent just a couple days ago so i still think be, and again, the fundamental reason for being when we're saying that I think rates aren't going up as fast, the 10 year could go up. I'm mostly talking about the short term rates if they start to pull back stimulus, because then potentially uh, the long end rates could rise. So I think it's a buy at three, 313 with a target of the psychological level of 4% on the upside. This is the uh, June micro 10 year CME's suite of micro products and a stop placed at 2.80. 
clearly below a clear break of the 3% is where the stop is. Is it stupid just to think, to fill in the fundamentals on a trade when you look at a chart and know exactly where your stop should be as your first thing? Bob I, or Billy? I, I, I like, I mean, I like the trade. I'm not, I don't have any positions on in the, in the, in the 10 year. I obviously think rates are, are going to be, you know, like you said, they're, they're not going to be you know, rising at a fast pace right now. I think those, it's been digested. I like tech because of that. Uh, I'm, I'm overexposed in other things, you know, that I, I don't, I don't have anything on here, but the 10 year, no, you just said overexposed and you don't have anything on in the on, same on, 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 <laughs> Overexposed on, overexposed in, in, in the future, like long, oh, S yeah, yeah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, long S and P long NASDAQ starting to build positions in micro copper and stuff like that. But, but the, the 10 year uh, did hit the 21 day moving average yesterday, hit it again today, couldn't get through it. That's the breakdown point from, from the, uh, on the heels of the May CPI number. So, you know, if you're trying to if you're trying to buy yields, you know, this is where you do it. Bobby? Yeah, I'm a little worried about this one now, but um, I, I see I still see it as a longer term trade. And I think the stops and the targets are wide enough away that you might be OK with this. It's interesting to look at over the last seven sessions, 10 years dropped 38 basis points. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, wow. We almost yeah. dropped below three percent this week on the 10 year. Um, yeah. I actually got a, a slight memory challenge for you guys, because I'll tell you what, this shocked the hell out of me a year ago. Where do you think the three month yield was now? Full disclosure. It, what did it close today? 170. Somewhere three month there. yield a year ago. I'll say 0.18. 20, 20 basis points. Point yeah, 0. 0. 5, five basis points. Five basis points. Okay. Five a year ago. That shocked me. I thought it had to be Billy, somewhere around I was 20. closer by two. <laughs> I thought it had to be somewhere around 20, to be honest. So I, I'm worried about this trade a little bit. But again, I think you're wide enough where you're not going to get crushed. Hey, Billy, last question for you. When you talk about going to your cabin in the woods, is it really a cabin or is it like my cabin in Colorado that has Wi-Fi and beautifully comfortable beds and perfect heating and cooling? Is it a cabin cabin or my kind of cabin? No, there's no AC, but there is, uh, there is Wi-Fi. Okay, good. And you have television? Uh, yeah, television, cable. And comfortable beds. You're not sleeping on the floor or anything, right? Yeah, comfortable beds. Yeah. Okay, frankly, I'm sick to death of talking to you people. Do you guys concur? Yeah, yeah, I have a quick thing to throw out, really, for people who are watching the trades at all. Last week, I put on a silver short, right? And my target on the silver short was 2042, and we got to 2054 half, okay? I have a rule, and I feel like I should talk about it that if we get to 70 to 75% to my target and something is happening, I get out of the trade. The weekend is enough given the volatility that we've had lately and given the fact that there's an actual live war going on. So I ended up getting out at, at today's close, which is a drastic reduction from what I hope to make from it. But it was a profitable trade and I am out of it. Um, I just want to throw that out there. That's just a rule I've always had. Oh, and I uh, to add on to that, from last week, and some people asked about it on Twitter about my uh, ES trade that I had on from last week. Had on synthetically, but it worked perfectly. It did go to my level, and I got out. The tenure trade hasn't moved to my level yet, nor has it moved to my uh, stop level either. So uh, one for one for last week, and so yeah, are we good, Bill? Are you good? good? Thank you so much for joining us, Bill. Where can they follow you on Twitter? Uh, at Bill underscore Baruch. Okay, I you put put out a lot of good stuff, Bobby. I want you guys to have a good weekend. Uh, can I be the first to hang up? Nobody's gonna mind, right? Nope. <laughs> See you, Billy. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Thanks.